Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to our webinar series, Embracing Change. We have an absolute gift, the superstar from San Francisco, Mr. Dennis Jaffe. How are you doing, Dennis? Well, I'm, I'm glad to be here, Faisal, and, um, and to be part of this um, uh, uh, great community. Thank you, Dennis. We just spent some time in FFI in Boston and uh, had a beautiful meal together, and uh, it was ab an absolute pleasure. Thank you for taking the time to spend right. together there and to be with us this morning. And um, I think most of you, most people out there know you, but maybe just a couple of words to introduce who you are and um, what you're up to. Well, so I've, I've been in um, the field of uh, family business and now family wealth um, since it started. I mean, there's always been family <laughs> wealth, but um, it was never a, a topic of study or something that, that people thought about as, as a, a problem or, or something that, that, that ought to be looked at. And, and family businesses, people knew that they were there, but they just kind of considered them kind of substandard, um, not quite yet a business. And um, the, 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 the prevailing wisdom uh, at uh, business schools was that the best thing to do with a family business is to get the family out of it and make it a rational business. And, and uh, a group of people in the 80s started, uh, got together and um, it, was, um, it was a wonderful gathering. It was a gathering of um, family uh, bu uh, business professors and family therapists and lawyers and accountants. And we started saying, wait a minute, um, there's some positive things and there's some important things and, and, and that, that family businesses are not going to defamilyize themselves. Yeah. And um, it, it, that, that is what business is all over the world. And what we have to do is start to study it and take it seriously. So I, um, by background, I'm a sociologist uh, and I have a business uh, degree. And somewhere along the line, I also became a licensed clinical psychologist and family therapist. Okay. So those credentials got me invited to those initial meetings. And um, I had been working in, you know, in kind of a traditional business strategy and working with business cultures, bringing together merging cultures and things like that. And um, I first came, I had no idea what family business was. I mean, I knew, but it's why were we having a meeting? <laughs> and I just kind of, you know, <laughs> dropped in. And um, it was a meeting that, that changed my life. It was like saying, wow, this is so important and nobody has paid attention to it. What a great thing. And I just kind of went said, whoa, this is really going to be great. We we're going to invent something. And um, so I think the people that, that created it are kind of uh, um, are <laughs> kind of we call them social architects. Um, they're, they're people that that really are um, are innovators um, in society. Society and and um, that small group has led to a uh, a focus of uh, research, focus of practice, focus of business schools, a focus of education, um, a focus of, of all kinds of attention. That now is a very very serious um, uh, you know part of um, of of the study of family business and family wealth. There is a study of family family business. And uh, that's how I got into it. And um, so that was the mid 80s. And um, I've just been <clears throat> focused on uh, helping uh, advisors. I've been on the boundary, I think, between being an advisor and being a um, researcher and a professor. And I've always felt that um, research is not an independent field, but research yeah. is something that should be gathering information to make practice better and to make families better. Yeah. It's not something in itself. And so I've been a um, kind of a, a, a bit of a um, atypical um, researcher because I'm in the field of, uh, of practice and working with families and always asking, well, research is going to help families figure out how to be better at what they want to do. Um, and exactly. um, I think research and, and, and practice have, have, have done a little bit of too much diverging yeah. and um, not talking to each other. And I'm, um, you know, really wanting to keep, make that boundary um, much stronger and, and much more trafficked. All right. So you're one of the old guard. 
uh, one of the elders, uh, or, or well, maybe the, not an elder yet, <laughs> almost an elder. It's a funny or, thing to think about, yeah, but uh, yeah. Amazing. So that's a beautiful segue into what we're going to talk about, right? So culture, right? So I'm sure one of the core things that you, you found as you went into these family businesses and family enterprises, they're called now, some of them, um, right. I think one of the key differentiating pieces, I would assume, is culture. So what is culture? How important is culture? And, and what does that mean? And is there a difference when it comes to family-owned versus non-family-owned enterprises? Well, there's, there's a, 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 another thing that you have to start with first. And okay. This is a very, um, it's so obvious, and yet it's so impactful, which is that family business are two words, and, and family yeah. and business are the, the, the two worlds and the two realms of existence. And what, what you're doing in family business, and, and, and so what we were, you know, the original idea was you keep family out of business. Family is what you do at home and yeah. business is what you do at work and they yeah. shouldn't be. But in most of the world, that isn't the way it is. Yeah. And so the, the challenge is that the, uh, the family business is a blend of the family culture and the business culture okay. and the business uh, family culture is about acceptance. It's about, you know, you are, you are always a member of our family. We go out of our way to support you. Um, you know, we, we love you. It's about love. It's about emotion. It's about connection. It's about support. And it, it, it's that, that human relationship and business is about accountability and about results and about, um, you know, doing something and, and and thinking about it and and you, you're not guaranteed um, to continue to work you have to be productive and so the the main issues and dilemmas of family business is you're pulling together the family culture and the business culture and and they're they're, they're anywhere in the world they're different and so you're putting together two issues so so fa so the the issues that that we as practitioners, face is well, well so you're you're having a conversation i'm talking to you i'm talking to you my um you're my son you're my employee you're a person who is um not an owner but wants to be an owner and this is something in in business in other non-family businesses you don't have a a group of people that are not owners but expect to be owners yeah Potential you owners, have, you know, people that are thinking <laughs> of buying Apple stock, or you know, you know, are not are not an important constituency until they buy the stock. But but in a family, you've got a you've got sons, daughters, um, other uh, in laws, and things like that. And and the, the question of of, uh, 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 of future owners is a real constituency. So you have this culture where people are talking, and 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 they have a hard time seeing. You have to be able to specify, I am talking to you as your son. I'm talking oh, to you as hats. my father. I'm talking to you because you're my employer. Mm -hmm. And there's, I have to respect you as an employer. I can't turn around and say, I'm your son, um, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> I don't, I won't do it. <laughs> I mean, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> And, and so a lot of the conversations and a lot of the decisions that are made are made um, for family reasons rather than um, uh, based on you know, good business practice. So, so the first thing I think that family um, business practice began to see is that they had to help people not um, do away with family because um, you've created a great business and um, it's very successful. And, and the first, you know, the kinds of things that begin to go into your mind is, I would like to turn this over to my children. Um, now, and, and, that, and that's a challenge. So, so the idea of culture is there's family culture and business culture, and, and how are we pulling them together? On the other hand, um, there was another, now another, another dimension, my work is as a business professor, um, in the 70s and 80s, we began to talk about corporate culture. Yeah. And we had books, you know, like Tom Peters and, and yeah. Waterman. And more recently, we had the, you know, the, the, the built to last and, um, yeah. uh, you know, and, and, um, uh, and uh, co corporate cultures, things like that. And we began to see that the success of a business is not about how rational they are. 
It's really about how they create a culture where people feel like they belong, where people feel like they matter, where people feel like they're respected, where people feel like they're treated fairly. And um, what we found was very interesting is that the the initial, you know, kind of, you know, idea that people had is if if, if businesses were more rational, they'd be better. And then the, the culture research began to say, wait a minute, that's not, that's not really what, what, what's important is to create a culture where people belong, not be rational, not, not just, um, and, and so this was in a way the, um, the antithesis of um, in the, the 70s and 80s, we were in the, 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 the spell of, um, of, of Jack Welch and, um, and, and GE, and that was the, considered the great way um, uh, uh, of business. And, and of course, now we're seeing that, and, and people in the cultural field were saying, well, that, that, that is, that's an approach, but really creating a meaningful community um, produces more excellence than creating um, rational accountability and uh, ranking people and kicking the the bottom quarter out every quarter yeah, every year yeah. and things like that and so so there was a real there was a battle uh, between the 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 kind of the the culture people in business and um, and the rational um, people in in business where you could just you know cut costs fire people um, versus the creating of a community and what we found was very interesting and because I, I was I was there is that the ideas that were coming up about um, uh, about what was a strong culture was in family business. And, and I, I met Tom Peters and it's like, well, gee, did you notice when you wrote the search for excellence that 75% um, of the companies that you talked about were family businesses? And that isn't even in the appendix of, of search for excellence. <laughs> And 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 then it was a little bit uh, clear in in um, you know in uh, in to last uh, to last yeah. they did understand that, that that these companies were cultures and they talked about how they had a culture of family and they were almost cult like yeah. and um, and and so the idea of culture so what we know is that that the the way that culture is created is by um, the family owners by the family owners having a set of values. That they that they maintain and a feeling that they that they are family, but then saying, well, family isn't just me and my blood family, and it, so, it, family is the other people that work here, yeah. and um, creating. And this is where the word family gets pulled into kind of family like atmosphere in in a yeah. um, in a company, yeah. and and so you know, the idea of culture. Um, began to be uh, we, we began to see that 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 the, the one of the best ways to create a strong positive culture is from values and one of the best way to create values is when a family um because family owners um first of all they're they're not necessarily uh, looking to quarterly results they're not people that just bought in and and said i'm going to buy in and i'm going to get my turn it around and, and get out in, in five years. Family businesses are people that say, I want to pass this on to my grandchildren. Yeah. The title of my book is called Borrowed from Your Grandchildren. Yeah. And it comes from the the the, 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 the saying that, that comes from Native Americans, but also comes from business culture, which is that you're not, um, you don't uh, uh, own a family business, you borrow it from your grandchildren. <laughs> if you're doing that, that means that you're, yeah. you're basically in a long-term view, and therefore, your grandchildren, even when they're young, what they believe, what they want, what they're concerned about, um, and um, and preparing something long-term for them is something that you're doing, and that that really affects um, the decisions that you make in the business and the um, choices that you make and the way that you retain people and the way that you um, you know, look at long term versus short term. You invest in the future. Yeah. Um, but but do you think that do you think that like I'm just thinking my right now, for example, obviously I have I have no grandchildren, I have children, but do you feel that because there's a huge, I mean not a huge, but there is a disparity in terms of how they would do things and how would you would do things, right? Mm -hmm. So do you feel that a lot of the family businesses are paying attention? to bridge the gap as they move forward. Yeah, they're doing long game. I agree with you, right? Long game is very clear. 
but are they looking at, hmm, am I hiring so that my kids would be able to relate to my team? Am I, am I uh, co-creating something where they would be aligned with how I'm doing it? Do you feel that okay, there's well, that let, level let's of consciousness? Look, let's look at it that let's look at that question in a slightly different way and, and okay. say, obviously, some families are and some families aren't. And yeah. any, that, that's yeah. the answer to any, everything. But now, now we ask the question, um, what is the difference um, of impact and, and, and what is happening in the families that are paying attention to that and the families that aren't paying aren't attention they? to yeah. that? And the families that are paying attention to that, and, and, and this is, a, is a, another wrinkle um, that we have to look at today, which is, you know, so I'm, 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 I'm an elder. Okay. Uh, I am. Um, I am working many, many years longer than I ever thought I would, okay. and and I'm looking ahead to the future. I'm not looking yeah. in the yeah. past. And, yeah. and 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 um and I look at family business people, and they're not they're not sixty or seventy. Sixty used to be old. Now you know <laughs> eighty um and yeah. eighty and eighty five and ninety. They're still working. <laughs> now let now play it out. Okay. Now. I'm I'm 90. I'm working. Well, I have children. My children haha, are are 75. Well, that's that, that they're yeah, thinking. No, 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 that's 75 that you are you had a kid when you were 15. That's that's a little early. They're okay, 60, okay, 70. So, so six, 60 so, to so, 70. You know, yeah. So 60. Um so they they are and they have children that are, <laughs> are that 30 are 30 30s. <laughs> And the thirty-year-olds are starting to have children, so now um, you know. So, so now um, the idea of thinking about your grandchildren is not a pie in the sky kind of thing. It's like my yeah. grandchildren are in my right, face. right there in their forties, <laughs> yeah. and um, and so families that are that are effective, and this gets gets into the research that I've been doing on long-term fam families that are effective are kind of understanding. Well, gee, I'm this age. My kids are this age. We we we're not just thinking of moving from one generation to the other anymore. We've we've got four yeah. living generations, yeah. and we all have to have roles, and we all have to have um, uh, a meaningful way of being in it. And 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 probably for me, um, the 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 eighty five year old, I should be thinking about letting go, and yeah. and I, maybe I'm not going to go away, but but I shouldn't be. Um, I shouldn't be uh, running things, yeah. And um, and even my my children, um, you know, who are you know should have been running things 10, 15 years ago, and they should be looking at their children. Um, yeah. and, and and so the challenge is that the the younger generations in these families, um, so so the grandchildren, um, in their thirties, we've been a wealthy global family. They've gone to schools all over the world. Yeah. They've traveled. Yeah. They're tech natives. Um, uh, they're, they're, they've grown up with technology. They understand uh, all these things. The older generation does not. They have um, different values. They're looking ahead and saying, gee, um, I'm 30. When, when I'm 80, uh, what is the climate? What is the uh, environment I want to have? How is... Uh, what is the world going to look like? So they, they have concerns and, you know, uh, the, the 80, 70, 80 year old person, <laughs> what do I care? I'm going to be dead, you know, it's, but, but, um, but they're not, they're going to have grandchildren. Yeah. So um, again, so, so the families, these long-term families are getting together and are saying, well, let's look at the business and the wealth and, the, and, and what we do with our wealth and our resources to um, deal with all those different levels of reality. And, and yeah. that's, that's the culture uh, of the future. That's where we, I say, look, I have concerns. Um, uh, you know, the older generation doesn't, isn't about making more money. They're about legacy. The legacy um, are, is two, three generations down. So they have to listen to each other and they have to have conversations. And so, um, so the, the idea of culture then it becomes that that the families, these extended families, have a culture um, of, and and you know, 
large families that are that have been in work in in, in operation um running businesses for for generations have a, a family group of 40 50 60 people and it's growing geometrically yeah and so in some ways <laughs> there's a family culture and a business culture but they can't be separate they have to be really um interconnected and they they have to be thinking about family is thinking about what do we what not just how do we make more wealth but what do we do with our wealth and and what's it for and um and then the businesses and and you mentioned family enterprise we use the word family enterprise because when a family gets to third or fourth generation if they've been successful they may have sold the legacy business they certainly taken wealth out of it and invested in other things yeah um so they may own you know two or three businesses they may own hey i own a bank i own a sports team i own some land i own a ranch <laughs> you know um i have a foundation so yeah. we call a family enterprise because by third or fourth generation the family has several entities that that they're looking at and, and they they want to look and and the values and the culture span all of those all different these, um, yeah. all those different entities so you 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 studied 100 year families right so what right. were the key th things that you found let's say three key points that you found made those families sustainable and able to stay you know um resilient and agile and adaptable to be able to arrive at that hundred year plus so these were so 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 i studied i wanted to study you know i wanted to do the built to last yeah. for family business um yeah. Yeah. and um and so um what i decided first of all is i'm studying families yeah. not businesses i'm studying yeah. families that have been together as a family with an identity as a family and as a business or several businesses for more than three generations. Yeah. So they were large, they were successful, um, and they had moved into the third uh, generation and they were both families and um, bus businesses. Okay. And I was looking at the family. So um, the first thing, um, and I, I, I would say they're the loudest um, uh, commonality. And, and, and by the way, let me, let me, let me give it a side here. Yeah, I started out on a different. I did not expect to find the things that I found. I okay. started out studying global families. So I studied. I interviewed a hundred families in twenty countries all over the world, okay. and I had expected to write different chapters about different countries and different cultures and ah. things like that. I did not expect that it to be there to be common themes, and and so the common yeah. themes that I ended up writing about were not what i expected i expected much more diversity and um oh. and yet the common themes came and they came from every continent all over the world and uh <laughs> yes there are cultural differences but these themes are um meta cultural they're they're yes. beyond yeah. the culture so the first thing and and i think this is critical is that, that, that you don't run a long-term family enterprise um, without making a choice in the second or third generation that that you are successful as a business or a set of businesses or, or you've created wealth you have to um, uh, make a commitment to say what we want to do is create a great family is invest in the yeah. family not it the, part of they talk about educating people to take over the business no it's it's a question of in, of, of basically investing in the family doing things together um having values that they share making the values real doing things that are important and um as as our mutual friend jay hugh said it's about creating um non-family capital the things that people are concerned about by the third generation it's not that they've lost interest in making money and running good businesses there are some people in the family that love running businesses and developing and growing but the, fo the the focus of the family is also on non-financial wealth yeah. on how do we how are we connected to each other how do we what are our values and how do we live them what kind of impact do we want to have in the world and if they don't have those shared 
values and that shared culture, then the third generation, the, these young people in their 30s are going to say, hey, I got a great education. I've, I've got lots of money. I've got, um, because of my education and because of my community and growing up, I have a lot of options. Uh, I don't need this family. And so in, if they want to maintain the family, they have to offer something. And this is where the, the family culture is what they offer. They say, aha, yeah, you can go off. You can join you know, a, a, a consulting firm. You can become an investor on your own. You can do all kinds of wonderful things. Uh, but together we have this entity and together we have this foundation and together we do these things and together um, we have this name and, and reputation and which we stand for things. And, and this is really something that you want to be part of. And it isn't sometimes, and by, by the third or fourth, it isn't either or thing. It isn't like you have to either work for the business or you're out. Yeah. A lot of people work, um, Outside. do things on their own. They do yeah. investments. They work in foundation. They work in social ventures. Uh, they do things, yeah. but they also are part of governance. They're part of the boards yeah. of the family. They come to family meetings. They are, they are involved in family affairs. Um, they're helping with the family foundation. Um, so, so, so they, they have a, they, they, they make a, a commitment um, to be part of the family in an active way, even if they do other things. So, so that was the family has to make it attractive. So the family has to make it attractive. Families stay connected. Yeah. And they have, and to do that, they create a strong family organization. They have family councils, they have family meetings, they have family value statements. Um, they, they, do, they, they do things in the community. They stand for things. They, they, and, and they're, they, they stand for things in a real way, not just verbally, but they really stand yeah. behind them. And they like each other and they value each other and they learn from each other. That was number one. Um, so, so, so then the, the, this, I think the second um, thing is that they, they create a culture um, where um, people have roles and um, it's, it's organized around family and business and um, people see it as, a, as an entity that needs a lot of attention. And um, they have to have family meetings. They have to have family policies and organizations. They, um, uh, they, because every family continually, young people are, are growing up. Yeah, and I when mean, a young person grows up, not only do they have their own ideas and their own values, but they do this incredible thing where they find another person and they bring them into the family. And so the families are bringing in new people and new ideas. And so the families become more and more diverse communities. And so the family has to create an organization um, around that. And, um, and these families have a very, very strong family organization as well as a business and financial. Um, so so uh, they do basically what, what Philip and Iraj and uh, Kenneth are talking about, that circular economy and exactly, family. So exactly, exactly. It. It, so they're it's nailing a, it. So they're really nailing they're, it. We call it two pillars. There's a family pillar yeah. and a business pillar, and they're intertwined and interconnected. Okay. Okay. And, um, and uh, the governance structure, I just, uh, we just had a meeting um, a couple of weeks ago of a network of, of 100-year families that I... Um, oh, wow. network of families and they all drew their governance structure that every single one of the families drew a different one but they were all very complicated oh really and, and all of them were were working on um it, it was never it never ended it, it was always the governance was always changing as the new generations came in as the new businesses changed um the, the uh, everything uh, new leaders had to emerge every generation. Um, the families were always changing, so um, none of the families that were uh, successful hundred year families were had any sense of being able to rest and and and, and yeah. post coast, um, yeah. coast forward. They they were all um, uh, actively reinventing themselves. Wow. And, and so that's, 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 yeah, that's, that's, that's the then maybe the third theme yeah. is that these families are continually, yeah. they, they, they aren't like, um, they get to a certain point and then, then they just, they just mint money. Um, businesses mature. Yeah. 
businesses, um, you know, have to be sold. Um, yeah. There's a right time to sell, as every business person knows, as well as um, as well as uh, and and um, and so these businesses are continually uh, evolving. There, um, one thing that was very um, interesting in, in, in the hundred families, a hundred percent of them did this one thing. They all had a mechanism where if you grow up in the family and you look at the family and you say, you know what, I'm glad to be part of this family. I'm proud, but I don't want to be your business partner for the rest the rest of my life. I don't want to be a captive business yeah. partner. Uh, they all have an exit policy. And every wow. single one of the hundred families did not have all of the blood family members. They all had, they had family branches, they had family um, individuals and things like that who left the family. And if, and if you don't have this way of exiting, you're a prisoner. Yeah. And it, it may yeah. be golden, you know, it may be golden uh, handcuffs and it, it, it may be living in a palace, but yeah. you're still a prisoner. And yeah. so free choice okay. and, and reinvention. They're, they're, half of them had sold the legacy business. Of the wow. half that, that kept the legacy business, half of that half had non-family leaders. And by about the third generation, the family was saying, you know, we, we may have somebody in our family that's ready to lead our legacy business, but we may not. Yeah. Uh, we may just want to be on the board. Um, we may want to hire um, a brilliant advisor. And, and so these families had wonderful advisors but um, that they they, um, they were evolving and changing. Um, they were becoming more socially concerned and more um, concerned about the future uh, and the environment over generations. Um, and um, this is because the younger generation, I think, is, has more years ahead, and uh, they're they're looking ahead. So um, older generations say, "Well, you know, we never thought about." you know, ESG before, um, yeah, you didn't, but, you know, uh, it, it's time. And, um, uh, and, and, you know, the wise and successful families are saying, you know, I didn't think about that, but, you know, and it wasn't my concern, but now I see, and we have to start thinking about that and what, what we do and how we do it. Yeah. Um, uh, families are creating, what we call the family bank, where the family makes for-profit um, investments in, in um, things that are socially responsible. And also it makes um, non, uh, you know, it ma makes uh, philanthropic investments. Yeah. And, and, um, and in, in we look in families today, the younger families are seeing fam uh, philanthropic and non-philanthropic ventures as social ventures. And, and they want to make a difference in the world and they do it in different ways. There are for-profit ways, there is, you know, kind of uh, break-even ways, and there are giving kinds of ways. And uh, the family doesn't say, aha, that's non-profit, that's for-profit, that's the, this, the, the, the boundaries are that's in so the family are, are more connected. Yeah. That's amazing. Amazing. So I see, so, so, so these are, that, that's incredible to see that, that you're able to overall, across cultures, across countries, see commonalities which when you listen to it, makes complete sense, right? But I guess when you went in, even you with all that experience and starting in the 80s, assumed that there would be, you know, different chapters, like you said, to differentiate based on culture and, and uh, you know, and, and religion also, right? There's a lot of religions you must Well, religion and culture, this is interesting. So um, what, what's happened is that, it um, like the the original um, before there was a family business field. It's like rationality was yeah. king, and the West was in, and individuality and rules yeah. and and rule of law and all that was, was important. And that was what every, every all the forces were heading in that direction. Now, in family business, with the sense of creating a culture, what are we seeing? We're seeing in, in individualistic cultures. The idea of uh, wisdom, the idea of tradition, the idea of of enduring values and things like that. And there's a a way in which um, um, my uh, my colleague uh, uh, Jim Grubman and I have written yeah. about kind of the, the different cultures and how the the cultures are blending and and the individualistic yes. cultures are learning from cultures that believe in more harmony yes. and tradition and the 
cultures of harmony and tradition are seeing that a little bit of individuality, a little bit yes. of differentiation, and a little bit of innovation <laughs> is 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 needed. And there's a um, there's a culture blending. Um, yeah, my next book is actually the focusing on the yin and yang of me and we, because as I, you as, as you know in Asia, you know the first time I wrote I was when I wrote my first book. Before yeah. that, we had never used the word I because well, it was- is, This is not, yeah. and you know, um, and there's something to be learned about I, but yes. there's also, as we were saying, you know, before, before we started there, right now in the US, we're finding out that there is a, such a thing as too much I and, <laughs> and not enough we. Yeah. And, um, and the, the, the strains in the U.S. right now and, and in a lot of the world are about what do we believe in collectively? What, what yeah. do we all owe um, each other? Um, and how do we express that, that, um, that owing in terms of what yeah. do we do for each other? What's the yeah. safety net? What's the, the shared values that we have? What, what do we do about collective health and collective well-being and yeah. collective, um, you know, um, you know, uh, affluence, um, inequality, and, um, you know, and, 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 and these are, these are global uh, problems. They're not more individualism. Uh, it's not about individualism. It's not about um, uh, lack of individualism and, and collectivism. It's really about how do we have a world in which both things are, are important. And um, it's not easy. So going, going. Let's let's go to the the last topic we want to touch on. I think right. it, it flows well with Jay calls. You know, wealth equals well being is what we're talking about. That whole right. me and we, the collective, the I, and mm -hmm. uh, you and and Jim have been working on this concept of you know wealth 3.0. You know, would love to hear you unpack that and and right. understand what 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 does that mean and why. Why is this now coming up and so important? Well, so so one of the things that we've seen in the field is a is um, a, a um, uh, there there are a lot of ways in which we're using fear to motivate people. Um, advisors are using fear and saying, "Well, you'll you know, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves is is really about when you look at that that homily. Of course, a lot of people. Um, it's true of some people, but it's not the basic norm. The basic norm yeah. is people have wealth and they 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 keep it. Yeah. But um, the the idea of, of shirt sleeves to shirt sleeve says one person makes the wealth. So it's an I statement, and yeah. then it's kind of demeaning. The second generation um, they don't do very much. They just kind of okay. operate things and <laughs> they make the machines go and things like that. And then the third generation is a bunch of spendthrifts. Yeah. That's well, that's so far from yeah. being any kind of useful way of looking at the world. Yeah. Because, um, first of all, the fact that you've made wealth doesn't mean that your, your kids are not going to be motivated. And it doesn't mean your grandchildren are going to be spendthrifts. Yeah. And so that there's a negativity around that. And there, there's yeah. all these things about you. People will lose their wealth. People, um, and, and there's even an, an attitude that, 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 that a lot of wealth creators have that that wealth is 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 toxic and say i don't want to i don't want to spoil my kids that's the number one thing that people say um uh I, wealth if 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 they inherit their wealth they'll they'll, they'll become lazy yeah. uh, uh <laughs> that that, that yeah, it's, it's not the case and it isn't yeah. wealth doesn't make you lazy um <laughs> wealth um but but um you know some families are able to pass down a work ethic and a, and a respectful kind of way in which people say, well, what do you want to do that's important? Yeah. And you have wealth and therefore the, the, the opportunity is, is greater. Yeah. You could do even more. And um, the responsibility is greater too, and, as a custodian of that. Business. And, and so, so in wealth 3.0, what we're, what we're doing is we're trying to take the negativity out of it. We're trying to take, okay. uh, move away from, from uh, making motivating people by, for example, creating restrictive trusts, um, secrecy. Um, don't, I'm not going to tell my kids where wealthy is one of the most ridiculous things. <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> obvious, say. right? Right, Dennis? <laughs> um, you know, that, that, that you know, wealth is going to spoil my kids. And we're, we're trying to create a, a, an environment where wealth is um, 
Uh, it, it doesn't deny inequality, and it's not denying that there are social problems. But 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 the idea that that wealth is a is a responsibility and a benefit, and um, how can we help families get positively involved? And and we and and we're uh, we want to kind of create an environment where advisors are not creating secrecy and restrictiveness and 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 limitations and 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 kind of projecting negative energy on yeah. the next generation and really create an environment where families work together in a collaborative way to say how can we responsibly use uh what we have and 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 it's a um uh it, 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 we have been impressed and and motivated to do this because we we we've seen all kinds of ways in which um assumptions um negative assumptions about yeah. wealth um, are are slipping into lexicon. For example, in in media, yeah, it's it's just not interesting to talk about a successful family and a loving family. And so so uh, you know we have all of these um, uh, dramas about you know about wealth and inheritance, and they're all you know <laughs> it's terrible. Um, <laughs> and um, and it isn't that 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 positive things don't. They're just not dramatic, and they're they're not uh, yeah. focused on. Yeah. And uh, the media doesn't like them, so so the, there's that. So so the 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 world is and 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 there is resentment. Um, it, it is not fair yeah. that that people have a billion dollars, and um, their uh, you know people in their community don't can't get a living wage and things like yeah. that. Those are issues, and and yeah. it isn't um, that to take away from the achievement of the wealthy person to say, well, maybe you should pay. Maybe there should be more social investment in the culture and in your community than, yeah. um, um, you know, than uh, uh, than we have, and and that yeah. that that this is not diminish your achievement, but um, you know, giving <laughs> giving uh, it, it's interesting. Tax is not taking money away from you; it's really yeah. investing in the community, and it, it's exactly. kind of interesting when people say, "I don't want to be taxed." Yeah. And the real question is, does my tax create an environment in the community where yes. people can thrive? Exactly. And if it does, I won't do it. Mm -hmm. But 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 people say, but if your your tax money goes to do some things that um, you know, I mean, you know, um, that are that are destructive, that are negative, that are um, creating um, you know a negative environment, then of course um, I I'm going to try not to pay. Uh, taxes, but tax is not an evil, yeah. and that that's a that's a, a, an example of something that that wealth three point would would not be saying tax is bad, <laughs> and and less tax will make it better. Um, three attitude would would be saying, well, let's look at where wealth goes and let's see what what kind of a community we create in order to make um, uh, enterprise um, able to to do the wonderful things that we know it can do. Yeah, because wow. that 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 tax is able to create a culture within the community, right. which then allows for that enterprise to be able to function safely, economically, and in a you know in in, in a smooth manner, right? And that's you know it's, 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 it's about giving back. It's, it's a social building. investment. Yeah, and, and the <clears throat> the climate crisis. I mean, you know, the, the issues that we're beginning to see about climate. It, 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 there's no way in which individual philanthropy can do the things that need to be done. There has to be a reorientation of social priorities. And that's what, um, you know, what we're seeing in, in, in families and we're seeing in, 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 um, uh, you know, in, 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 in a lot of wealthy communities where they're saying, well, really, we, we have to be looking more widely at the kind of community and the kind of, um, you know, kind of culture that we're building. Culture is not um, just me and my family. It's not just me and my business. There's a um, a community culture and a um, an estate, um, you know, government culture, and all of these are cultures that that we uh, have a responsibility to improve. Yeah, but that's the thing, right? The 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 presidency or the leadership is kind of like the corporate guys, right? They come in for four or five years and then rotate. And the question becomes: Are they able to play the long game? But then again, when you have the other end. You know, you have another another issue, oh, right? Where is, they can. 
And and the the problem, is, I mean, the problem is not is not long, is really it, uh, to me um, looking looking at, at social issues. It's about a short and long term thing, and 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 yeah. and and and, um, and it's about being a responsibility of being a citizen yeah. rather than having just a voice to to say yeah. how am I um, being responsible and um, and and are we um, looking to um uh short-term benefit um or long term and there's yeah. tough trade-offs and, and things today where we say well we have to continue doing this um because people need heating oil to get yeah. through the winter <laughs> and uh, but that's oil <laughs> and oil is scarce and it's kind of yeah. like well we don't want to you know forbid you know um you know and, and even some people are using coal which is even what, and, and it's like, you know, it's like there isn't a right and a wrong way, but, but the, yeah. there, there's, um, uh, and, and, you know, and this is where um, families are learning this in their families. And, and I think wider communities have to be looking at that uh, as well. All right. So we're, we're coming to a close to our conversation. What, right. what, is there something you'd like to share, something you'd like to reinforce, remind? Um, before before we come to a close, what's any anything that we didn't touch on that you'd love to? Well, I I think that um, the 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 power of families and family enterprise uh, is, is it is the engine. It is the 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 foundation of of literally every country, every part of the world. The family businesses and wealthy families are um, are the economic engines um yeah. developing countries sometimes even more but even in the most developed countries the the long-term family and um what what my personal mission is with my work and what i see a lot of people in the family business field is is to help those families use their wealth and use their privilege wisely and thoughtfully and yeah. um it's not easy, and 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 um, and there, there's a lot of work to be done, and and so um, it, it's it's kind of looking at the work that wealthy families have to do to make a difference, um, and and how and, and and our role as advisors is to help those families be productive and wise and thoughtful and effective at when they define their values at making making them real and 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 that's the, the 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 awesome power that i see in family business so that's amazing as the largest contributors to gdp as the largest employees they are in, in employers in in most countries you're bringing in going back to the fundamentals and saying you have this custodianship you have this stewardship of this incredible amount of wealth which brings power and freedom and responsibility you know, how are you going to play this out? Let exactly. us help you not put handcuffs, but rather create a, 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 a system where there's communication and there's relatedness and there's thought process. And like you said, the culture of love and community and culture, but to bring it out and make it even larger. So not only within the family, but within the business and the philanthropy, but within the whole community as a whole and think bigger picture as in collective is that that's what I'm here. And, and that's what you and I are doing. And I think that's what the, the people that are listening to this podcast are. That, that's what our community is about is the responsible yeah. use of the resources, the incredible resources that we've been able to unleash. And, um, and we just have to look and say they're, they're not, as, as someone said, the, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the, we have the resources, they're just not deployed. Yeah. <laughs> In, in, in the right way. Um, we have all the wealth we need, um, uh, but but it has to be um, it has to be uh, used in, in the right way and and uh, we're falling far short on that and and, that, and that's the work that we're trying to do with families, with family business um, uh, you know in these communities. So thank you, Dennis. You're an absolute example thank you, of this the, is the a 80... wonderful. The 80, 90 year old patriarch matriarch that you spoke about that is still thinking the long game, still active, right? You know, you started in the 80s, you've been contributing, you've been writing, you've been speaking, you've been advising, you've been research, doing a lot of research. And, and I can still see that you know that there's a lot more to be done. And that as somebody who's an elder now with the wisdom is able to 
be heard, right? And, and be considered so that you can impact generations to come. So really on behalf of all of us listening, all of us that are in the space, that our family businesses ourselves are very grateful to your contribution to Jim, to Jay, to, you know, Philip and, and all the others who, who have been chugging along, you know, for mm -hmm. the last 30, 40 years or more, right? I mean, um, you know, that, and that's to the just... new generations that are coming up, the new leaders, the young leaders that are, <laughs> that are, um, the that are our future and that we have to step back and, and help them, uh, do, uh, take the leadership that, that they can take. Yeah. So once again, thank you, Dennis. Thank, thank you, you for thank you for your time and incredible conversation. Thank you everyone for being with us and look forward to um, being with our next guest uh, very shortly. Thank you. Thank you.